February 4th, 1913, Paul Tisch was born right here in Mount Vernon, Ohio. His parents would die within a few years, his father during the Spanish flu of 1918 and his mother shortly thereafter. After his parents passed away, Paul would wind up in the foster care system. He'd be in the Knox County Children's Home. Eventually, he would be taken in by a family, Mr. or Mrs. Lee Davis. The Davises had a daughter as well, and Paul would eventually wind up falling in love with and marrying their daughter. In the late 1930s and early 1940s, World War II would break out, and Paul would wind up joining the Navy, serving in France, Italy, and Okinawa, before being discharged and coming back to live with his family here in Mount Vernon. Now, shortly after returning, his family was, and everybody that knew him would say that he, he seemed like a different person, and they weren't sure exactly what to make of it. He would be remanded to the Knox County home where they would try to get him some help, but that wouldn't be quite enough for him. Now, it sounds like Paul was probably suffering from PTSD, but back then they, didn't, they weren't, weren't really up on mental health stuff and they didn't really know, they didn't call it PTSD. A lot of people called it shell shock when people came back from the war, so that's most likely what Paul had was PTSD. They didn't know how to treat him and he would wind up being sent here to the Cambridge State Hospital, formerly the Fletcher General Hospital and World War II POW camp. Today there is actually a hospital of similar origins that sits across way back there on the other side of this hill back here. It's, a, it's an active working hospital so we can't go there but this site was actually part of that as well. Built in the winter starting in 1942 and completing in 1943, this is a 1502 bed facility to built to treat soldiers that were coming back from the war. It was expanded into a 2,000 bed facility with 168 buildings and a German BOW camp before the end of the war. So about 17,608 veterans were treated over the course of the time that it was open. So in 1946, the military hospital and POW camp was shut down and it was revamped and became and reopened as a Cambridge State Hospital in, in, later in 1946. That stayed open until 2008 when it was bought by a private organization. And today is the Cambridge Behavioral Hospital and a state operated and state operated Cambridge Developmental Center. So Tish would often break out of the state hospital and every single time he would run back to his family in Mount Vernon. His family would then return him to the hospital for treatment and then he would break out again and, and the cycle would just repeat itself. Until December 8th, 1952. On that day, Tish would break out of the hospital, but rather than returning home, he would go missing. His family didn't know where he was and nobody, nobody could figure out what had happened to him. The leading assumption by some people was that he just kind of disappeared and he was tired of going back and forth, but his family never bought into that and they always held out hope that he would be found somewhere. After Paul Tish went missing on November 28, 1953, two days after Thanksgiving, a man named Lester Melnick sat in a restaurant here in Danville, Ohio, having a nice meal. It was a Saturday afternoon, and just as he was finishing up his meal, he was telling everybody he was going to meet somebody, but he didn't say who he was going to meet. So Lester was a 58-year-old farmhand working on a local farm for a man named James Flack. Shortly after finishing his meal, Lester would get up from the table and walk out the door, never to be seen again. About seven months later, here in West Lafayette, Ohio, a school teacher who was also a part-time car salesman named Clyde Patton would get behind the wheel of a new car and head out to a small farm near Nellie, Ohio to show the car to a local man. It was June 2nd, 1954, and Clyde was hoping to make a sale and be home by supper time. The morning of June 3rd, Coshocton County Sheriff Kemp would receive a call from Mrs. Patton reporting that her husband was missing. Upon investigation, Sheriff Kemp would discover that Clyde had shown the car to a Mr. Cletus Reese the day before, and the dealership had recovered the car from Mr. Reese's driveway with no sign of Clyde anywhere. So Sheriff Kemp would head over to the Reese farm to question Cletus about what had happened with Clyde the day before. By the end of the day, he would wind up arresting him as Cletus would confess to murdering Clyde after they had had an altercation. Now after the arrest, Knox County Sheriff Paul Cochran would come into Coshocton County to question Reese about the disappearance of Lester Melnick. Now it had been rumored that Lester had had some kind of relations at some point with Cletus 
and it was rumored that Cletus might have been involved in his disappearance somehow, but before this time they hadn't had any proof and they hadn't had any way to question him or any reason to question him because he was a free man. During the interrogation, Cletus would actually confess to Sheriff Cochran that he had in fact killed Lester and he buried the body on the farm. However, he would later recant this saying that he'd made it all up. The body of Clyde Patton would be found near this very spot right here on this farm behind me. It was the farm of Cletus Reese. Shortly after Clyde's body was found on June 10th, the son of Lester Melnick would come out to the farm to begin searching for his father's body, who he believed may be buried on the farm. During that search, as he was walking around, he would find an indentation in the field that looked like something was buried there. He would alert authorities, and they would come out, and they would discover a second body. However, the second body was not that of Lester Melnick. It would turn out to be another victim that was yet to be identified. The remains of Lester Melnick would, however, be discovered right here on the farm on June 12, 1954, buried very close to the house, right behind a shed, within a few feet, within about 100 feet of the house. A couple of days after the remains of Lester Melnick were discovered, the unidentified remains would be identified. It turns out that the remains belonged to Paul Tisch. So it would turn out that Cletus Reese had been hospitalized here at the Cambridge State Hospital in 1951. He was admitted in August of that year and released on a trial release program in December. The doctor that had seen him diagnosed him with schizophrenia. And he said that while he did suffer from hallucinations of soldiers killing people on his land, he wasn't a violent person or a danger to anybody. The doctor would also state that Cletus would benefit from interaction with people and being released into the care of his family would be the best thing for him. So, in December of 1951, Cletus's sister, Ethel, would take charge of him and she would put him in a farm that she had recently purchased up, ne up in Coshocton County, near Nellie, Ohio. So, after his arrest and subsequent discovery of all three bodies, Cletus Reese would be interrogated as they tried to drill out of him what exactly the story was behind the bodies found on his farm. Now, many times when they were trying to get him to talk, Cletus would become inconsolable. He would begin crying and he just, he, he would seize up and wouldn't talk. And, and so the authorities were having a lot of trouble getting the information out of him. Now, when they did get information out of him, a lot of that information would conflict with direct evidence that they had. For instance, he would say that he had shot all three victims with a pistol. However, none of the three victims had any bullet wounds or any indication that they had been shot and where he said he had supposedly put the gun in his house, there was no gun to be found. So there was, there was some questions there about the authenticity of what he was saying to the police. So one thing that Cletus did say is that Mrs. Truman, the first lady of the United States, had actually given him the order to kill the people. Now, of course, that wasn't true, but it kind of built the case that he might be a little mentally unstable. So Cletus would be charged with first degree murder but he would be sent in July to the Lima Mental Hospital for evaluation. He would be held there for 30 days before being declared mentally insane. Twelve years later, on May 16, 1966, Cletus Reese would pass away from a heart attack in the Lima Hospital at the age of 48. He's buried right here at this spot. An obituary was published in the paper, but hardly anybody showed up at his funeral. From all accounts, the murders that happened in 1954 were completely preventable. The fact that Cletus had been in a mental institution, the fact that he had been diagnosed as schizophrenic, and the fact that nothing had been done and that he just kind of released him of his own cognition and that his family didn't take it seriously. All of those things combined mean that these three people didn't have to die. Paul Tisch, Lester Melnick, and Clyde Patton. None of them 
None of them had to lose their lives if the system just would have worked. Cletus Reese may have been a murderer, but he was also a victim, a victim of a system that didn't bother to keep up with him, didn't bother to treat anything that he had going on, and it cost the lives of really four people. So that's gonna do it for this episode of Ohio Legends and Tales. This is a story that I had first uncovered several years ago, and I completely forgot about it until I was, I was doing some other research and I stumbled across my notes for it and I started re kind of digging back into it and trying to learn more about it because it was titled The Story of Murder Ridge. And I think when you label something as a legend like that, it, it draws people's attention in the wrong way. You know, teenagers will go up to Murder Ridge every year around Halloween to kind of spook each other out, but nobody really knows the true story of what happened there. I don't even know if they know the true location because I had trouble finding all of the locations I needed to find for this video just because they're so, they're not documented very well. So before we end it here, I do want to take a minute to thank the patrons. I like to thank them in every video, but especially in these Ohio Legends and Tales videos because the patrons are the ones that, that help fund a lot of these things and these kind of videos. So if you're interested in joining the Patreon, there's early access, there's behind the scenes, there's all that kind of stuff. So head over there, I'll, it's linked down in the description below. This, uh, I just want to let you guys know I've got merch. <laughs> I've got the, this is one of the shirts that you can buy. There's also other, there's other things over on the merch shop, so that's also linked down below, so go check that out. That's all I've got for this one. I want to thank you all for watching. Everybody have a great rest of your day, and I'll see you in the next one.